it chose me because even though I wanted to be a singer, I wanted to be like, you know, Barbra Streisand. That was my, you know, she was my idol back when I was a kid. And I, wanted, I just wanted to sing. I didn't care where it was. You know, when I was a little girl, you know, I was five years old, I sang at the Apollo Theater amateur night, you know, with a band that my father hired, you know. So I knew I had the bug, I knew I had it, but I, the acting thing I didn't which was very interesting. So, but I went, to the, I went to Manhattan School of Music. My mother put me in everything I can because I was just like, this is all I want to do. And I did not stop bothering her until she put me through all of this training, which is so important because if I didn't have this training, I don't think that I would be here today. And the Boston Conservatory, which was my college, Boston Conservatory of Music in Boston, uh, came to the High School of Music and Art to have auditions and for college. And I didn't know where I wanted to go. I didn't, you know. And sure enough, I just said, I'm going to just audition. And I did. And I told my mother. She was like, oh, it's a private school. Oh my god, I'm going to die. She was a single mother, you know. And uh, I got in. I got in with scholarships and almost full scholarships and uh, financial aid and whatnot. And um, that's where I learned that I actually had some sort of acting talent. I didn't know before. And then, so I feel like it chose me. I feel like I was there at the right time, and then I learned, I, I had it, and that's what I wanted to do. All of a sudden, musical theater was what I wanted to do. Before she sings out of sight of mind is like where is she coming from? What's happening in her life at that time? And I want to say that Madame Defarge is just one of those characters that has just been holding up this venom in her life the whole time. And what's so difficult is she's uh, now starting to let some of that venom seep out of her pores. And um, in the time of the, the, the book where, or the play, where actually she sings Out of Sight, Out of Mind, is when um, her child friend of the, of the neighborhood gets killed by the Marquis. Now she's had some sort of idea that it might be the Marquis and his family and his brothers that killed her family. So she's had this idea. So when you have an idea like this that is just constantly um, just boiling up in your system, uh, like you know. I'm mean, back then; they didn't have televisions, they didn't have anything. So it's 18th century. You're just sitting there. You all you have are your thoughts, and so she is completely wrapped in her warped thoughts. And um, and I think that that was the last straw, and that was when she made the decision that she was just going to let her venom out. And seeing it upside of her mind was kind of very therapeutic for her because finally she was going to let everyone know that, you know what, we might be out of sight, but we are not out of mind. And so I think that's where the song takes you in the show. I loved playing her. Um, uh, I think that no one is born evil. And I think that all the movies that have been made about Tale of Two Cities, you see Madame like, ooh, she's scary, you know? Because all the women are like, oh, kill, 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 you know? Um, what was, what's, what's great about doing it for the theater is I didn't, you know, she's this iconic character, you know? She's just this like evil, uh, mean, want to kill you, you know, she'll stab you in the back kind of character. And um, I wanted to make her a little bit more human you know, uh, for the audience and make her more human. And because, again, like I said, no one is born, born evil. There's got to be something that happens in your life that kind of goes, click, flips the switch. 
I think that any classic novel that has the evil character, uh, there's always a, an evil character in there. But what was so uh, profound about Manu Defarge is that she is a woman in the 18th century. And, um, you know, women were not looked up to back then. Women didn't have power. Women have, they didn't have the right to vote or, or do anything. Just bear children, keep your family, and keep your mouth shut. I think that um, the wonderful thing about Madame is that she has power within herself. And she, she, was, she owned a wine shop, which, you know, maybe uh, th th I think that was kind of rare for people to own their own business back then. It was successful, whether it was, you know, a coin here, a coin there. But, you know, I don't think they made a lot of money, but I think it was more about the neighborhood and it was more about people and getting together. And um, I think that what was so amazing about Madame is that that's where she found the revolutionaries. You know, it's like, you know what? I'll give you a free glass of wine, but you have to listen to what I have to say. You know, and I believe that that's where she got all the camaraderie and that's where she got, was able to get this revolution going. You know, it was just right in her wine shop. And nobody even knew. People just thought, oh, it's a wine shop. People are just sitting there drinking. She had a purpose. When I played uh, Ava Peron in Evita, you know, that you, you kind of, I'm not a method actor, you know, I'm not like, Wah, take over, it, it's everything, it, you come home and you're the character, you know, you're on the phone to your mother, you're, on, you're the character, I, I'm not like that. But there are some roles that you can't shake. And um, I, that's, there's, a, there's a technique that I do that I try to just look in the mirror and I try to just look, where's Natalie? Oh, there she is. Hi, you know, because sometimes a character like Madame Defarge is so intense and so uh, anxiety-ridden, you know, just just to try to get through the show, that I come home and I I find her following me, you know, uh, in my daily life, and I've had to shake her, you know. Camila in the Heights, she's more like a mom, you know, she's kind of happy-go-lucky, stern, you know, Latin mom, you know. Uh, Sometimes I, it takes me just 10 minutes to shake her, but I'm already, I'm still doing the show, but I never bring her home. So it's, it's very interesting, the dynamic of the characters, of which one you're playing. You're playing a happy character or a really sad, evil character or, or whatever. It just, it, it does, it does become part of you and it does change you, I think, because you always go home with a little bit of it and then when the show's done, you still are part. She's still in there. This is the first time professionally I'm playing a Latin person. So I always play French people. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> They're not as dark as I am now. No. <laughs> Just got back from vacation last <laughs> night. That's why I'm so dark. Um, but um, it's interesting playing a Latin role and also being in the company of Latin people, um, which is so interesting because 10, 15 years ago, this might have not happened. And I don't think it would have happened. You know, um, when I was on Broadway in Les Mis playing Eponine, another French girl, um, there weren't any really Latins on Broadway or even in the business. They were in the business, but I don't think there was anything for them. It was really hard for me to get an agent because they would look at me going, hmm, what do I do with you? They didn't know where to place me. There was hardly any roles or even television things. Now. You know, now it's cool to be Latin. Now it's the in thing, you know. Now I can get a tan and go into an audition and feel good about it, you know. But, um, but playing Camila is interesting because, again, I'm in the company of Latin people that are just so grateful that there is a show like this that depicts the real people, the real Latin people, real, you know. It, it doesn't show that Latin people are, you know, drug dealers, murderers, you know, car thieves. It doesn't do that at all. It shows that we're real people, and we are, you know. And so Hollywood kind of depicts that, that Latin, you know, the Latin thug, you know. So it's interesting that to be in a play that has such heart and then bring it out across the country to people that have no idea, I mean, it's a rap, it's rap, hip hop, it's reggae, it's Latin, salsa, merengue, you got theater pop, you got all sorts of music in here, which I thought, how is that gonna work? But it works when the audience feels that this is a very universal story. But playing a Latin person, 
I, and a mom for that matter, I, you know, kind of channel my mother and the way she raised me and stuff like that. And it's funny because when my mother saw it, she was like, that ain't me. <laughs> That's how she talks. <laughs> She's like, that ain't me. I said, no, I mean, I'm channeling you. I'm not playing you. <laughs> you <know? laughs> Here I am, you know, first uh, replacement on Broadway as Eponine. And I couldn't get an agent for three years on Broadway. Yeah, Broadway. We're not just talking about, you know, a community theater where you have to have the agents come and fly to another place. This is like New York, Broadway. Um, it was, that was difficult to swallow, but I never let it stop me. And I think um, I like to conquer those giants as well because the giants for me are, it is the business, is just the, 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 the culmination of, of all the negativity that this business has to offer. So if you can conquer that and just step on that, every time there was one, one in front of my face, you know, there's producers that get into your face. There's, you know, agents or, or just the, 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 the threat of the fact that you may not ever get cast again. You know, there's all that. And then with that comes insecurity. And I think that's the biggest giant um, for me in my life that, that I've had to conquer is, the, is not to get insecure. You know, I don't feel insecure. I feel very grounded. I have my roots on the ground, my tree, my tree roots. That's how I always look at it. Like, I'm a tree, plant your roots way deep, and the tree with the wind, whoo, but it always comes back. And there's another hurricane, whoop, it always comes back. You know, that's my visual for myself, you know. But when I was 20, I might have not felt like that. You know, I might have felt like, oh, I was a branch, <laughs> you know, that's flying around, you know, trying to get stuck on a tree, you know. So, um, so those are the giants that I try to conquer. Probably um, the biggest thing you have to conquer is that fear of not being good at what you do. If you really feel inside, and no one can tell you that you're not good enough, no one can tell you you're not, you're not a good writer, you're not a good singer, dancer, actor, whatever it is, painter, whatever it is that's in the arts. You're a creative person, you could write a book. You're still creative. You're still creating. You know, no one can tell you. If you feel that spark inside you, you got to continue. Don't let that flame go out, in other words. And because there's always going to be someone trying to blow it out. And um, for me as a woman, back at Les Mis, the only Latin person around that's working, trying to figure out. That's why I was in the show for so long. Because I didn't want to leave the show without an agent. Because I knew that if I left the show, I may not get another show, you know, because I don't have representation or something like that. So then, then it happened. Then all of a sudden, all the roles started coming in, and, and um, I just have to continually remind myself that everything happens for the right reasons. Even if you get a little show down for no money, I can't tell you how many times I worked for no money, you know, and it was the best experience of my life because you're, you're either the show or, 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 or the, the, the actual book is amazing, what you're saying, whatever, it's a poem, whatever it is, it, it, it's still, you're creating and you're learning your craft as well as meeting people. And I think that um, I also let the youngsters know that it doesn't matter who you meet. You know, you treat them with respect and, and honor because they're trying to do the same thing even if they're producers. So they're all, we're all trying to create. So, um, and be nice to everybody because you never know. <laughs> that person that you were mean to in ninth grade could be the next hot Broadway director and then you're going in for an audition. You're like, ah. <laughs> so, I mean, just try to be kind to people because uh, eventually you might need them. <laughs>